My name is Curtis Jacobs. I'm honored by uh, Scripture Central to try this podcast. It's really a pilot program. And so if at the end of this you liked it, please get comment below. We'd like to see what kind of response, both negative or positive. Um, my hope in the future, if it is one that they'd like to continue, is to begin in the 23-24 Scripture year, uh, Book of Mormon, bringing in a young single adult, both male and female, to be a part of this. Um, a little background of me. Um, I'm a Utah kid. I've taught in the church education system. I know this is gonna sound long for over 40 years. I've actually had the opportunity of teaching children of parents. Um, I love the gospel. Uh, my greatest passion in it is to learn the doctrine of the church. What makes us unique? Why we should continue to believe? And so this particular one will be a part of the Come Follow Me in the New Testament year. Um, I always want to use scripture, words of the prophets, and occasionally I love to use people who are not members of the church, but are true believers in Christ. As a matter of fact, the most oft-quoted non-Latter-day Saint in conference, if you look it up, is C.S. Lewis. Now, many of you have heard that name. Most of you know of Lord of the Rings. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien actually converted, helped in the conversion of C.S. Lewis. So I'd like to begin with a statement of his and see if you can defend it. Here's what he said. Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. Now, what I'd like you to do is kind of chew on those words and see if something resonates as to why C.S. Lewis is correct. Again, Christianity, if false, is of no importance, and if true, of infinite importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. Another scholar by the name of Timothy Keller kind of gave us a reason why that statement is true, and that will be our topic for today. Here's what he said. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about any of what he said? The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teachings, but whether or not he rose from the dead. Do you now understand why Lewis says it cannot be moderately important? Let me show you a picture. If you know where it is, uh, it's kind of a sacred place to me. Um, if you've never been there, uh, this is called St. Paul's Episcopal Church. It's the oldest church in downtown Manhattan. Matter of fact, George Washington actually worshiped in that building. We had the opportunity years ago to go down there. Let me show you another picture from kind of the street view. You'll notice as a lot of older churches had, um, they have a graveyard out front. Well, if you've never been here, let me tell you this. The reason this building has such significance for me is when we went there, if you were to turn around from that picture, you would actually see 9-11. Now, obviously, there's the one tower there at the time, but when we were there, they were still building the one tower. Think of 9-11 and how we lost 3,000 people. Every single one of those individuals, because of Jesus Christ, will be resurrected. Let me show you one more picture. Now, if you've ever been there, that's a piece of sacred territory as well. It's Arlington Cemetery. Over 300,000 of our men and women in service have been buried there. Again, I sometimes look at a place like that and think of what the day of the resurrection will be like there. Anytime we go on a trip, my wife always wants to stop at the cemeteries and find the oldest cemetery, oldest headstone. Let's talk about now the importance of the resurrection and why it is the cru crucial doctrine of Christianity. President Howard W. Hunter made this statement. Without the resurrection, the gospel of Jesus Christ becomes a litany of wise sayings and seemingly unexplainable miracles, but sayings and miracles with no ultimate triumph. No, the ultimate triumph is in the ultimate miracle. For the first time in the history of mankind, one who was dead raised himself into living immortality. He was the Son of God, the Son of our immortal Father in heaven, and his triumph over physical and spiritual death is the good news every Christian tongue should speak. Now, when we think of the evidence of the resurrection, one of the things I was impressed with is if you take a look at all of the different references to who saw Christ, either on the day of the resurrection or soon thereafter, please note, as most of you know, the very first person to ever see the Savior resurrected was Mary Magdalene on the morning of Sunday. She'd gone back there evidently to help finish the burial preparations, finds the tomb empty, then sees the Savior, reaches out for him, Rabboni, to which he responds, Touch me not, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. Next, you'll see other women see him returning from the sepulcher. The reason I point that out is if you look at all the rest, there's no other reference to the women. Let me tell you why that's a little bit important. 
I did some research. If the resurrection and the story of the resurrection was a fabrication, a made-up story to try to convert the Jews to Christianity, you would have never started, don't be offended, ladies, by talking about women first. So why is that important? Because unlike today, um, in the time of the Savior, men basically had all the say. They were the ones that would be called as witnesses to any kind of event. To start with women in the times of Jesus would have been absolutely a negative enforcer of the resurrection. But to start with women shows the reality of the importance of the resurrection and the reality of it being true. So let's have some fun. As Latter-day Saints, one of the blessings of being a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is that while I love the Bible and the witnesses of the Savior and of His resurrection and of His teachings, as Latter-day Saints, we are not limited to just the Bible. We have other experiences of the resurrected Savior. Most of us know the beauty of the story of the Savior appearing to the Nephites soon after His death and resurrection in the old world. We understand where the Savior and the Father appeared to Joseph Smith in the first vision to kick off the dispensation of the fullness of times. The experience of Sidney Rigdon and Joseph Smith seeing section 76, the three degrees of glory, where they see both the Father and the Son. And one last one, obviously, the Kirtland Temple, where the Savior comes and accepts the offering of the church in the early days of this dispensation. So we have many witnesses of the resurrection. Now let's talk about some of the things that we might differ. Years ago, there was a national poll of Christians on what they believed about the resurrection. Um, let me ask you as a Latter-day Saint, if we were to ask what percentage of active Latter-day Saints would believe Christ physically rose from the dead, what would be the percentage? Well, I've asked that in my classes and automatically they're all like, well, all of us would believe in the physical resurrection of Christ. Notice what this survey found. 65 were absolutely certain Jesus was physically resurrected. Second question, what percentage of us as Latter-day Saints, if we're active, would say that as a result of the Savior's resurrection, we will also be resurrected? Well, again, we would almost automatically say, well, that's 100%, right? Notice this survey found that just barely over one-third of the Christian world believes in their own resurrection. Now, why is that even significant or important? As Latter-day Saints, we believe in a physical resurrection with some great blessings that we're gonna talk about. For those a little older, you might remember that back on the day on TV, there was a thing called home makeover. They would go to a house and completely redo it in one week. Well, years ago, when that was on TV, there was an article in Newsweek magazine that actually called it God's miraculous makeover. And here's what they said about the resurrection. See if you agree, disagree, or somewhat undecided. Here's what it said. You likely believe that when you die, you're going to heaven. More than 80% of Americans do, but in what form are you? You? If so, are you old or young, fat or thin? If not, what are you? Well, according to a Newsweek poll, only half of Americans think of the resurrection as a physical event. More than a third think of it as something spiritual. An, an ascension of the soul that leaves the corpse behind. However, Paula Fredrickson declares, our bodies will be the very same as the ones we had in life, but buff and beautiful. Now I'm hoping we will all agree that the buff will be the guys and the beautiful will be the women. But I think if you look at what she's trying to say, we can agree with some, but not others. Let's talk about the beauty of the resurrection in terms of our own physical body. I joke, and we'll probably do this if I continue doing this, with my stature. I'm a big 5'7 on a good day. I hope in the resurrection some of that can be made up. But many of us know people who have infirmities, deformities, physical ailments, etc. When I was a brand new bishop uh, here at, in Logan at the YSA ward, I had a young lady named Susan. Susie, she actually went by Susie. She, she was in a wheelchair. My very first event, probably shouldn't have done this, as a ward was to bungee jump. Well, I was out there, my counselors were out there, the state president actually showed up, we got him to jump, which meant I had to jump, my counselors jumped, some of our wives jumped, and Susie, in her wheelchair, comes up to me and says, Bishop, I wanna jump. Well, I look at her, I'm like, Susie, how, how, how can we do this? And she goes, Bishop, don't worry, I can't hurt anything. Well, after I chuckled about that, I got one of my biggest young men, literally put her on his back. He climbed up the stairs. They held her, put the harness on, and just let her go. And she was free as she fell down below and they finally got her off the mat. The reason I tell you that is she came up afterwards and she goes, Bishop, one day 
I'm going to outrun you. The beauty of the resurrection tells me that will be true. Notice this statement from 2016. Each of us has physical, mental, and emotional limitations and weaknesses. These challenges, some of which seem so intractable now, will eventually be resolved. None of these problems will plague us after we are resurrected. The miracle of the resurrection, the ultimate cure, is beyond the power of modern, me modern medicine, but it is not beyond the power of God. For all who have laid a child in a grave or wept over a, the casket of a spouse or grieved over a death of a parent or someone they loved, the resurrection is a source of great hope. What a powerful experience it will be to see them again, not just as spirits, but with resurrected bodies. That's Elder Paul Johnson. So let's talk about why the resurrection is so important to Latter-day Saints. Grab your scriptures. I hope you don't mind using them. Here's what it has. In section 138, which is the only section that Joseph F. Smith received and it's recorded, here's what it says. Now, this is a revelation into the spirit world between the death and resurrection of Christ and what he did as he went to the spirit world. But notice verse 50. For the dead had looked upon the long absence of their spirits from their bodies as a bondage. Well, what does it tell you? That those who have died want their bodies back. Second, go to section 93, verse 33 and 34. Again, this is quite unique to Latter-day Saint theology. That's what I love about it. Notice what it says, verse 33 and 34. For man is spirit, the elements are eternal, and spirit and element, inseparably connected, receive a fullness of joy. And when separated, man cannot receive a fullness of joy. Well, what does that tell us? That ultimately, element must there refer to physical things, right? So when the physical body and the spirit body are reunited inseparably, we can receive a fullness of joy. Without it, we can't. That is uniquely Latter-day Saint. How does that differ than the rest of the Christian world? Elder Holland, in his classic style, nailed that one in a conference talk. Notice what he said. A related reason the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is excluded from the Christian category by some is because we believe, as did the ancient prophets and apostles, in an embodied but certainly glorified God. To those who criticize this scripturally based belief, I ask at least rhetorically, if the idea of an embodied God is repugnant, why are the central doctrines and singularly most distinguishing characteristics of all Christianity, the incarnation, the atonement, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ? If having a body is not only not needed, but not desirable by deity, why did the Redeemer of mankind redeem his body, redeeming it from the grasp of death and from the grave, guaranteeing it would never again be separated from his spirit in time or eternity? Any who dismiss the concept of an embodied God dismiss both the mortal and the resurrected Christ. No one claiming to be a true Christian will want to do that. What's Elder Holland saying? That as Latter-day Saints, having a physical body in a resurrected form is something we all should desire. While most of the world doesn't see God as, as a physical person, to us He's our Heavenly Father. And as such, the Savior brought His body out of the grave to teach us what we need to do. As a matter of fact, as, as I was going through this, I realized that even the Savior didn't say he was perfected until the third day. In Luke 13, 32, an interesting little verse uh, in reference to Herod, he says this, And he said unto them, Go ye and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out devils and do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. So even the Savior didn't declare his perfection, ultimate perfection, until he was resurrected. So here's what we're going to do. I'm hoping that many of you are young enough to remember taking tests. This is not a tough one. I've just got five questions I want you to consider, true or false, five statements. Um, think about them, write them down, whatever. We're going to go over them because of the importance of the doctrine. Number one, a resurrected body and a spiritual body are the same thing. True or false? Okay. Number two, think about it. If you have an idea, go ahead. Number two. 
At the appropriate time, individuals will be given power to resurrect others. Number three, the resurrection brings men and women out of the grave as when they died, old or young. Number four, terrestrial people will be part of what is called the first resurrection. And then finally, number five, the resurrection is followed almost immediately by the final judgment. So take a look at the five statements. Give me the true or false, doesn't matter, let's just see. And I promise one thing, I will always back up what I teach, either by the words of the prophets or the scriptures. My opinion has no practical value. Um, ask my wife, here we go, okay. Number one, a resurrected body and a spiritual body are the same thing. When I ask that in class and I ask for a raise of hands, probably around 95 to 98% will say no, and I think I understand why. Let's try something. Grab your scriptures. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which, if you know your New Testament, is the chapter on Paul's teaching the people of Corinth the importance of the resurrection. It appears that somehow they would kind of lost the concept of importance. Now, the Apostle Paul, most of us know, for example, if you look at verse 40, the Apostle Paul mentions there are celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial, which immediately, as Latter-day Saints, we go, oh, three degrees of glory. Correct. The prophet Joseph Smith adds and bodies telestial. Little side note, do something. Go to a Word document, type the word telestial, it'll be underlined. That is a uniquely Latter-day Saint word. Let's go on. So he's now going to compare the physical body to the resurrected body. For there's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Now here he's going to compare the physical mortal body to a resurrected body. He goes on. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in, uh, it is raised in, in corruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Now here's the one that's the catch. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Brothers and sisters, I know this is technical. There's a difference between a spirit body, which we all were prior to our birth and mortality, and a spiritual body. One other reference, and then I'll show you a quote. Section 88, verse 27, says this, For notwithstanding they die, they also shall rise again a spiritual body. Do you see what the difference is? And I believe, honestly, from that previous uh, survey I showed uh, that was done in 2006, I think that's why a, a vast majority of Christians have the idea that maybe the, maybe the resurrection really isn't physical. They don't understand the distinction between spirit and spiritual. As a matter of fact, Joseph F. Smith made this statement. After the resurrection from the dead, our bodies will be spiritual bodies, but they will be bodies that are tangible bodies that have been purified, but they will nevertheless be bodies of flesh and bones, but they will not be blood bodies. They will no longer be quickened by the blood, but quickened by the Spirit, which is eternal, and they shall become immortal and shall never die. Paul declared that the body that would be raised would be a spiritual body. Don't feel bad if you miss that one. Most people do. Number two, okay? At the appropriate time, individuals will be given power to resurrect others. Now, before we answer that one specifically, I want to make sure of one clear distinction in reference to the Savior himself. Joseph Fielding Smith said it pretty plainly. Now, we have not power to lay down our lives and take them again, but Jesus had power to lay down his life, and he had power to take it up again. Jesus was the only person who ever came into this world who had power over death. And as he said in his own words in John chapter 10, if you want to take a look at that one too, and then we'll get to number two's answer. In John 10, a pretty simple statement, he says this, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Now, what about the rest of us? I remember being at Utah State University as a student. I was listening to President Kimmel give a talk in, uh, I believe it was priesthood, and all of a sudden he threw this statement that I had to look up I want you to see it. Here's what he said. This is clear back in the 70s, folks. He said this. President Brigham Young, the second president of this dispensation, said, It is supposed by this people that we have all of the ordinances in our possession for life and salvation and exaltation, and that we are administering in those ordinances. This is not the case. 
We are in possession of all the ordinances that can be administered in the flesh, but there are other ordinances and ministrations that must be administered beyond this world. I know you would like to ask what they are. I will mention one. We have not, neither can we receive here, the ordinance and keys of resurrection. He goes on, quoting President Brigham Young, The keys will be given to those who have passed off this stage of action and received their bodies again. They will be ordained by those who hold the keys of the resurrection to go forth and resurrect the saints. Just as we receive the ordinance of baptism, then receive the keys of or, uh, authority to baptize others for the remission of sins. This is one of the ordinances we cannot receive here on the earth, and there are many more. Now, every time I read that, I'm like, could you give us another list? Don't give us just the one. We do have one other. I thought at least I'd throw this at you. Elder Oaks, President Oaks, said this. President Spencer W. Kimball reminded us that there are other priesthood keys that have not been given to man on the earth, including the keys of creation and resurrection. So, number two is true. The power will be given to those, in my understanding, of those who are celestial once they are raised from the dead to give the power to raise others, which would be an absolutely beautiful thing as we get further into our questions. Number three, the resurrection brings men and women out of the grave as when they died, old or young. Now, when I've done this in my class, I usually get a kind of a mixture of answers. Many young people have all kind of heard something about maybe Joseph Smith teaching that if a baby dies, that the mother and father would have the power to raise that child in the millennium, and that's true. What's not so well understood is what he also taught. This is going to be an interesting comment. Notice what he says. As concerning the resurrection, I will merely say that all men will come from the grave as they lie down, whether old or young. Now, don't get upset. Don't get upset. I want you to understand why I, I, I hope to be able to explain why I now actually love this this point, this principle, this doctrine. Because let's be honest, when, when we die and are placed in the grave, can we just kind of be honest? Nobody's body gets any better. So notice what Joseph F. Smith said. I'll show you three statements in a row and then give you a little story. Here's what he said. What a glorious thought it is that those from whom we have to part here, we will meet again and see them as they are. The same person we knew and were associated with in our mortal existence, even to the wounds in the flesh. Not that a person will always be marred by scars, wounds, deformities, defects, or infirmities, for these will be removed in their course, in their proper time, according to the merciful providence of God. He goes on. Deformity will be removed, defects will be eliminated, and men and women shall attain to the perfection of their spirits. Would we be satisfied to remain forever and ever in the form of infirmity incident to age? No. From the day of the resurrection, the body will develop until it reaches the full measure of the stature of its spirit, whether it be male or female. And then finally, the body will come forth as it is laid to rest, for there's no growth or development in the grave. As it is laid down, so it will arise, and changes to perfection will come by the law of restitution. Now, that throws a curve at a lot of people because they're like, well, just a minute. I don't know that grandma wants to come out if she's 80 at 80. So let me tell you a little story. I was in California years ago giving a, a Know Your Religion series on resurrection and millennium. And I've, I've simply brought up this principle that the brethren have taught that as a person dies and laid in the grave, that's well how they will arrive, uh, arise and eventually be perfected. Well, after the lecture, this, this older lady, and I'm saying that kindly, she was probably in her 80s, just a sweetheart, comes up, grabs my hand, pats me on the hand and says, now, young man, I have a question. I'm like, okay. She goes, I understand what you taught about it, whatever age we die or however we die, that's how we're gonna be resurrected and then we'll be perfected. And I said, okay, what's your question? She goes, well, you can kind of tell I'm older. I go, mm, okay. She goes, um, my husband died when he was 25. And you could just see in her eyes, like, how's this gonna look? I'm gonna come out this old, old grandma and he's gonna come out this young buck. She goes, and I said, so what's your old question? I was nervous to try to answer. She said, um, do you have anybody who has says how long it will take to be perfected? And at the time, I didn't have the next quote. So I want you to see something that, again, I will explain why I love this doctrine. Joseph Fielding Smith quotes the very same three quotes I just gave you and then says this. While he, meaning Joseph F. Smith, expresses the thought that the body will come forth as it is laid down. He also expresses the thought that, the body will that it will take time to adjust the body from the condition of imperfection. This, of course, is reasonable. But at the same time, the length of time to make these adjustments will not cover any appreciable extent of time. 
President Joseph F. Smith never intended to convey the thought that it would require weeks or months of time in order for the defects to be removed. These changes will come naturally, of course, but almost instantly. Now, I want you to think of something. For those of you a little younger, you probably still have all of your grandparents. And when you look at your grandparents, the only thing you see is an older person. I understand that, because I'm older. The only time you've ever seen your grandparents young are on beautiful little pictures, right? They have little pictures on their mantle, and you're like, oh my word, Grandma, you're really, you're, you're really cute or pretty. Grandpa, you look great. You've never seen them that way. Now picture the day of the resurrection. Your grandparents come out as you remember them, and then the power of God perfects them. For me, as I understand that, that actually is better than coming out absolutely perfect because we see the power of God and the power of the resurrection. I love that concept. So for me, to see my grandparents again as they were and to be perfected will be a joy. Number four, terrestrial people will be part of what is called the first resurrection. Now, some of you may have heard a phrase, the morning of the first resurrection. Uh, as a matter of fact, I remember asking a class one time, uh, how many of you in your patriarchal blessing have a statement that says you, you'll come forth if you're faithful in the morning of the first resurrection. And I had several young people raise their hands. Well, there was a girl in the class that didn't raise her hand, and she looks at me and she goes, Brother Jacobs, this is back in seminary, I kind of feel bad about this one. She said, Brother Jacobs, um, what if it doesn't say that? Now, don't beat me up. I just went up because she is such a good girl. And I went up and I said, it doesn't say that? And she's like, no. I said, it really doesn't? Are you kidding? She goes, what does it mean? I'm like, oh my word, if anybody in this class, I thought yours would for sure say it. Well, by the time I scraped her off the floor, I said, I won't say her name. I just said, don't worry. Just because it says it doesn't guarantee it. And just because it doesn't say it doesn't mean you will not have the opportunity of having it. But let's get back to the question. Why is it called the morning of the first resurrection? I'm now going to do a series of statements, both in scripture and in the book by Bruce R. McConkie. Here's what he said. Two great resurrections await the inhabitants of the earth. One, of the, one is the first resurrection, the resurrection of life, the resurrection of the just. The other is the second resurrection, the resurrection of damnation, the resurrection of the unjust. But even within these two separate resurrections, there is an order in which the dead will come forth. Those being resurrected with celestial bodies, whose destiny is to inherit a celestial kingdom, will come forth in the morning, notice the italicized, of the first resurrection. Now, he then uses section 88, verse 97 and 98. So we're going to stay there for a little while. This is kind of an order of the resurrection. 90. 97 says, And they who have slept in their graves shall come forth, for their graves shall be opened, and they also shall be caught up to meet him in the midst of the pillar of heaven. They are Christ, the first fruits. They who shall descend with him first, etc. Well, that's obviously the first group to come forth is those at the time of the Savior's second coming will be raised from the dead who are celestial. But then he says this. Look at verse 99. And after this, another angel shall sound, which is the second trump. And then cometh the redemption of those who are Christ at his coming, who have received their part of that prison which is prepared for them. And then, here's what Elder McConkie says. This, the second trump, is the afternoon of the first resurrection. It takes place after our Lord has ushered in the millennium. Those coming forth at that time do so with terrestrial bodies, and thus are destined to inherit a terrestrial glory in eternity. Did you catch it? Morning of the first refers to celestial people. Afternoon of the first represents terrestrial people because our theology teaches us terrestrial people are good, honest people. At the time of Christ, there obviously was a major, major resurrection. He came forth, and then it says, many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose. So the morning of the first obviously started with the Savior. Now we have a few people who have been resurrected since that time that we know of, we would probably say Moroni and Peter and James. But then at the second coming is another major resurrection of the morning of the first. And the morning of the first continue through the millennium because there are obviously celestial people on earth alive during the millennium. Now, the afternoon of the first, those who come forth in the terrestrial body, will not come forth until after the beginning of the millennium. But they are still good people. And at the end of that millennium, 
we will then have another event. Again, section 88, verses 100 and 101. And again, another trump shall sound, which is the third trump. And then come the spirits of men who are judged and are found under condemnation. These are the rest of the dead, and they live not again until the thousand years are ended. Well, I think you can guess. After quoting that, Elder McConkie says, These are the ones who have earned telestial bodies, who were wicked and carnal in mortality, and who have suffered the wrath of God in hell until the last resurrection, until the Lord, even Christ the Lamb, shall have finished his work, in reference to section 76. Their final destiny is to inherit a telestial glory. Now let's pause for a minute. One of the hard things to acknowledge is why do they have to wait so long to come forth? Well, they never accepted the Savior's inv invitation, never accepted His atonement and the blessings it offers in repentance, and thus it, it seems that they may have to pay for their own sins during that thousand years, or not, if, if not before, until they are cleansed and then brought forth by the power of the Lamb. And then finally, verse 102, and another trump shall sound, which is the fourth trump, saying, These are found among those who are to remain until that great and last day, even the end, who shall remain filthy still. Well, I think that's obvious. Finally, in the latter end of the resurrection of damnation, the sons of perdition, those who have remained filthy still, shall come forth from their graves. So even those who became sons of perdition in mortality, are guaranteed a resurrection, even though it's last through the power of the Savior. And so again, my attempt to do a graph. So the second resurrection doesn't even begin until after the end of the millennium. And those coming forth first in the second resurrection will be those of a celestial glory. And then finally, those who will inherit the uh, outer darkness, whatever, the sons of perdition. Now, hopefully you'll see that you and I would prefer to come forth in the morning and again, regardless, if we are a celestial being, we're part of the morning of the first resurrection. Now, the last question that I need you to consider was the one that said that the resurrection is followed almost immediately by the final judgment. Now, between you and I, whenever I would graph the plan of salvation, I'd always kind of put the final judgment at the end. Now, I will give you this. This is just one statement by President Oaks, but he gives several references, and I'm thinking, oh, it answered some questions that I had about additional scripture or other scripture about those who have been exalted. Here's what he said. Kind of threw me a curve. The principle of restoration also means that persons who are not righteous in mortality will not rise up righteous in the resurrection. Moreover, unless our mortal sins have been cleansed and blotted out by repentance and forgiveness, we will be resurrected with a bright recollection and a perfect knowledge of all of our guilt and our uncleanness. The seriousness of that reality is emphasized by the many scriptures suggesting that the resurrection is followed immediately by the final judgment. And that threw me a curve until I looked up all those scriptures. And then he concludes, this life is the time for men to prepare to meet God. Now, I want you to understand that one as well. Why would the Savior or the Father make a person wait to receive their final inheritance? When coming forth in the morning, you know you're celestial. I use this reference. To those who have graduated from college, when do you actually know you graduated? Not until you walk across the stage with a diploma? Ah, you knew at the time you finished your last course or got your last grade. So therefore, once you know, why wait? It appears that according to Elder Oaks, or President Oaks, that our resurrection will be followed almost immediately by our final judgment. Now, why does this all matter? Well, brothers and sisters, um, Elder Todd, uh, D. Todd Christofferson made a statement about the importance of the resurrection and ties, and this is what I want you to see, ties several concepts of the doctrine of the Savior to why the resurrection is critical. He said this, If Jesus was in fact literally resurrected, now watch what he does, it necessarily follows that he is a divine being. No mere mortal has the power in himself to come back to life again after dying. Next, what he taught is true. God cannot lie. Three, he was the creator of the earth, as he said. Four, heaven and hell are real. 
There is a world of spirits which he visited after his death. He will come again, as the angel said, and reign personally upon the earth. There is a resurrection and a final judgment for all. I love the way he connects all of those additional principles to the importance of the resurrection. And then this is the one that hit me the hardest. He goes on and says, Given the reality of the resurrection of Christ, repentance of any violation of his law and commandments is both possible and urgent. The Savior's miracles were real. Given the reality of the resurrection of Christ, death is not our end, and in our flesh we shall see God. Brothers and sisters, I love the doctrine of the resurrection, how grateful we should be for the Savior's invitation beyond the resurrection. But may I conclude with a kind of a personal note. This is a picture taken many years ago. Many of you know what it is. It's called the Garden Tomb. When I was had the privilege of going with my wife, a bunch of other church education men and wives, we went over there, and of course, one of the most beautiful places to go is to the Garden Tomb. Now, the Garden Tomb, surprisingly to me, was only like about 200 yards away from Golgotha, where he was crucified. Now, what's beautiful about that is when you go there, it's very peaceful. Now, if this was, in fact, the place where the Savior was laid, I want you to consider something. Think of what the angels told the women on the morning of the first resurrection. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen as he said. See, brothers and sisters, I had the privilege of going to the Holy Land with all of my other friends. Um, the year was 1988, about July, if I remember. In April of that very same year, I got a phone call from my sister, Kay, who lives in Syracuse. She asked if I was sitting down. This is when my family was living in Arizona. And she informed me that my mom and dad, who had returned about seven months earlier from a mission in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, were driving down the central part of the state of Utah towards a place called um, Payson, no, oh, past Payson towards past Levan, I'm missing out Richfield. Um, and she called and said, are you sitting down? I said, what's up? Um, my parents were in an accident and on, ironically, on my oldest daughter's birthday, they were both killed. And so the very day that we celebrated my daughter's seventh birthday was the day that both of my parents were taken from this mortality. And for the first time I recognized I'm now kind of on the front lines. So brothers and sisters, may I testify, the greatest part of going into that tomb is that it's empty. And because it's empty, we all can look forward to being blessed with a glorious perfected body because of the Savior and His Atonement. I love this doctrine, and I love this church, and I love the youth of this church more than I can tell. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.